Good morning, everybody. It's good to be with you uh, here. I guess we're all at home again this week, but we're another week closer to being back together face-to-face uh, -to -face with one another. Uh, I keep praying it'll be it'll be soon and that the Lord will lift this, this virus and this danger from us. Uh, until then, I uh, appreciate y'all uh, following our, our class Bible study, and uh, we're going to be in, in the book of Second Timothy this morning, and uh, I'm going to start on verse 13 of chapter 1, where we picked, left off last week, uh, where Paul, in this section, he's been talking to Timothy, evidently, that was experiencing a little bit of fear, a little bit of uh, timidity. Uh, he had, you know, if you remember, he'd encouraged him that God's not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. And uh, he's reminded Timothy that he's suffered and been through everything that Timothy's uh, experiencing, and he's made it through. And uh, verse 13, he gives him another suggestion of, of uh, something that'll carry him through periods of uh, persecution, trials, tribulations, fears, uh, and it's this, verse 13, follow the pattern of the sound words that you've heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Uh, King James, I believe, says, hold fast the pattern of sound words. Uh, Keep your, keep your grip on it and don't let go the sound words that you've heard from me. And we know words he heard from me, that's not idle conversation. Um, Paul is one of the apostles. Uh, it's apostolic teaching. Uh, it's the heart of our faith. It's the, uh, the truth that's been passed down by the apostles to the church that uh, soon would be codified uh, as inspired scripture in the New Testament. And so the pattern of sound words you've heard from me is, is what Paul is telling him to hang on to, what the apostles have taught, what Paul has taught Timothy specifically. Uh, and he's telling him, uh, and I like the King James Version rather than follow the pattern. King James says, hold fast, uh, which implies uh, someone's going to try to take the truth away from you. Uh, holding fast onto something, you, you can almost visualize in your mind uh, some enemy, uh, some foe trying to, to take that away from him, uh, take that, that sound teaching and substitute it perhaps with something else that's false or fake. So we have to hold on. Uh, we have to hold fast uh, to what we've been taught, uh, realizing there is an enemy and uh, his intent is to take the sound words of apostolic teaching, scripture, away from us, our foundation. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, although literally this book is a, a, an apostle teaching a preacher, Timothy, uh, in the broadest sense, this applies to all Christian workers. I, I believe we're all workers for the kingdom. Uh, we, we're all here to work until Jesus comes. And so uh, it applies to all of us individually. Uh, no matter what our role is in the church, but it also applies to pastors in a special way. They need to hold fast to the apostolic teaching, the pattern uh, of sound words. Uh, and therefore, I, I would say to you, uh, when we think about our pastors, uh, we shouldn't be thinking about them or grading them because they're really funny or they're really exciting or uh, they're never boring or anything other than are they holding fast to the sound words they've heard? Uh, in other words, uh, the criteria for our judging our pastors, our teachers, I would, I would add too, is, is that they are teaching us true apostolic scriptural teaching on a weekly basis. Uh, everything else, else pales in comparison. Uh, and it's interesting, uh, don't you think? If you look at verse thir it's verse thirteen, it's interesting that Paul says there there's a pattern to the truth. Uh, there's a 
there's a system to the Bible, to the uh, Word of God. It's, uh, and, you know, I can't, uh, I don't have time to explain to you uh, what's happened in my life to help me see that pattern, but I, I do think it's important to know that the, the Bible is, although 66 books written over 3,000 years on three continents in three languages by 40 different people, it's all one book. The Holy Spirit is the true author of the scripture. And it's a pattern. It's not chaos, and it's not uh, disconnected. It, it, it is constant in its theme from Genesis to Revelation that Jesus is Lord. This is what he's talking about, the pattern of sound words. And we don't hold it, uh, here we are Christian people, we don't hold it uh, in an antagonistic or mean-spirited way. He says, hold it in the faith and the love, uh, faith is something we hold it in, that we trust in it. We we place our confidence in the Word of God. Uh, and if, if You need to have confidence in the Word of God. If you don't have it, you need to delve into the Scripture and study it and learn that it's trustworthy. Uh, it's without error, and it's uh, authoritative. Uh, it truly is a capture of the literal words of God uh, to mankind. Uh, therefore, you can trust it. It's not like... Uh, teachings of men or culture. And I think that, you know, when we look at it, if we're going to take this pattern of sound words, we're going to have faith in it, and we're also going to communicate it in love, Paul says. Uh, anyone that has come to a knowledge of the truth that's been born again uh, longs for everyone else to know this salvation, this, this great life, this Christian life, this abundant life. And... Uh, it generates love in our hearts. Uh, we can have compassion for lost people because we understand they're doing it the very best they can often, but without without what you have, most precious, the pattern of the Word of God, that uh, you know what the truth is. You know what's going to happen in the future, but they don't. And uh, therefore, we can carry this pattern, not only trusting in it in faith, but we can also have love and understand uh, that it's important uh, that lost people come to know the knowledge of the truth and salvation. Uh, this is a, th a thing that, uh, you know, in our culture, uh, and, and this is not part of my lesson, I can't go off into this, I'm chasing too big a rabbit here, but our culture is based on whatever feels good, do it, uh, that whatever your truth is, that's not my truth. I've got my truth. You've got yours. And, you know, there's no absolute truth. Our culture is rife with this kind of teaching. And yet, verse 13 is communicating there is an objective uh, standard that God is going to judge the world by. It's the pattern of sound words that he's revealed to the apostles. And we have that truth. Uh, and we hold it humbly in faith and love. All right, verse 14. How do you hold that in faith and love? Well, here it is. You hold it by the Holy Spirit, he says, who dwells within us, and therefore we guard the good deposit entrusted to you. Uh, I would say to you right here, the good deposit he talks about is what he talked about in verse 13, the pattern of sound words. And so we've got two things. There's a great truth here. Number one is that a a man or a woman who has repented of their sins and trusted in Christ, Christ alone for their salvation, has been born again. And that born again uh, term refers to the fact that at that moment that we repent and trust Christ, the Holy Spirit makes our spirit come alive. It was dead in trespasses and sins, as Paul says elsewhere. But suddenly uh, we are born again. We have a new life. Uh, we have been made into a new creation, Paul says. So the difference between a Christian and a lost person is that the Christian has the Holy Spirit himself dwelling permanently in their spirit. He is there. He doesn't come and go. He doesn't uh, ever leave us. He's always with us. He dwells within us, as verse 14 says. And he's helping us 
to guard the truth entrusted to us. Uh, so that's important. You don't have to do this on your own. Uh, you're not by yourself. I don't care where you are and what you're going through. Uh, every Christian has the Holy Spirit. Uh, and that's, that's a great truth. And it's, uh, it's central to what we understand as we delve into this scripture here in second Timothy, uh, the, you know, the greatest claim of Christianity is not that it's some kind of new religion, uh, but that it is the truth. Jesus said in John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but through me. So when I say it's true, it's a truth, it's truth, Christianity is the truth, uh, we're saying that, that it describes life the way it really is. It's, it's, it's truth that came from the creator of life, God the Father, Jesus the Son, Holy Spirit. They created this life that we're experiencing here. Well, here we are. We're going to live uh, our lifetime on this planet Earth, uh, 70, 80, 90, 100 years. And this life has been created by God. And so when he speaks to say what this experience of life is, and what it's all about, it's truth. It describes life as it really is. Uh, Dorothy Sayers is a lady, an author that I, I've loved over the years, an English lady. Uh, she said the test of any religion is not that it pleases us, but that it's true. You know, you can find other religions out there that tickle your fancies, that they give you inflated, prideful statements that you are God or you can become God. Boy, that just tickles, you know, you pink. But that's not true. We are not God. Uh, there is a God. And he's not us. Uh, we are sinners. And when we trust in Christ, we're born again and we're forgiven of our sins. It's true. Uh, it explains life, in other words, the way it really is. You know, uh, you, you've probably seen this, I'll bet you. As you read the, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, several times in the Gospels, you'll hear people saying things. That they say it a little differently, but it goes to something like this. Uh, we've never heard anyone teach like this before. He teaches with authority. Uh, where did he get this? Where have we been that we've not heard this before? He, he was unique in his teaching. Well, what was going on right there was Jesus was teaching the truth. And I, I can't, I can't uh, explain it in, in depth. I don't have uh, too much to stand on, but I, I can talk about my personal experience. Whenever I'm hearing uh, somebody teach the truth or preach a sermon that's solid truth, uh, for me, it echoes something in my heart. It's like bells are ringing for me. It's like, that's the truth, what he's saying. Uh, I, I hear it. It corresponds to what I know in my heart is, uh, is the truth. And that's what Christianity is. It's the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guarding the good deposit that's been entrusted to us. Jesus is the truth. Uh, verse 15. You're aware that all who are in Asia turned away from me, among whom are uh, Phygelus and Hermogenes. Uh, boy, howdy. Uh, here you've got uh, two first century Christians called out by name in a letter uh, to the church, to Timothy. Uh, therefore, you know, we know from history, these, these letters of Paul, they were circulated to all the churches and on Sunday morning, Sometimes instead of a sermon, they would, uh, they would read these letters from Paul to the congregation. Uh, doesn't that bless you to know that your name's been recorded in Scripture as someone that abandoned the faith and walked away from Apostle Paul, and it's been read to all the congregations all over the known world? Uh, that's, that's, that's horrible. But there are two men, evidently, that Paul had uh, known and worked with who have turned away from him. They've abandoned him. Uh, now we know Paul, remember, at this time when he wrote this letter, he's in prison in Rome, uh, but he had been over in this part of the country, 
uh, and these two men had failed him. Um, defection. They had uh, defected. Uh, Paul experienced defection from his ministry. He had people walk away from him. Uh, Jesus did too. Uh, there's a tragic scene in the Gospels where Jesus uh, teaches about taking up your cross and following him. And it says many walked away. They didn't want to pay the price. Well, these two men right here, uh, they're not the only ones that Paul names by name, and they're not the only ones that ever walked away from him. But it's it's a sad testimony right here. Uh, people walk away, and I, I, I guess we'll have to be honest. Uh, we see that in our day too, don't we? Uh, we see people that have walked away from the faith. Uh, they're not they're not following after the Lord anymore. Oh, they might say, oh, well, gosh, we can watch TV at home and it's just as good. Or uh, I worship God when I'm out on my boat on the lake, uh, when I'm mowing my yard and s such craziness as that. But uh, the point of fact is the church is the will of God in, at this time. Uh, it's the church that Jesus is coming back for. And to defect from uh, following after Jesus is just as sad and serious as it is right here in Second Timothy and this, uh, this uh, defection that happened with these two men. Um, there was a teacher, uh, Dr. E.M. Blaylock, uh, he was a professor of classics at the University of New Zealand. He's passed away now. Uh, but he said of all the centuries, the, the tw this is the 20th. I know we're in the 21st, but okay. Of all the centuries, the 20th is most like the first. Well, what is he talking about? Well, I, I it's two things. Number one, the level of persecution against the Christian church in the 20th century has been documented as just as serious as it was in the first century under the Roman emperors. Uh, hundreds of thousands of Christians lost their lives. They're losing them today. Uh, persecution is great. China is doing everything it can to, they're literally bulldozing churches, blowing up churches. They're hanging uh, pictures of uh, their prime minister on the wall in place of Jesus. They're placing love of the uh, Communist Party as the first commandment and changing their uh, teaching. Uh, great persecution is going on. There's, a, there's, there's a, a time going on now that just like verse 15 documents two individuals walking away, that we have people today uh, that are walking away. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a sad, sad state of affairs, but I guess if anything could be said, uh, positive about this it's for you not to be surprised when it happens don't think oh well you know this whole thing is this whole church thing we've been doing is 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 not right uh for some reason it's not the truth friends it is the truth it is the truth and just as people walked away from jesus and paul uh they're gonna it's gonna happen in our time too uh it strikes a chord that all of us have to buckle up and be faithful and fight a good fight in this in this time that we've been uh, granted to live here. Uh, we're not going to quit. We're going to go, go on ahead. Uh, you know, Paul wrote this. Uh, they think this book here, Second Timothy, was written somewhere around 67 or 68 A.D. Uh, first century, first century book, the last book that Paul wrote before he died. And... Uh, just three years after this book was written, uh, the Roman armies under uh, Titus uh, surrounded Jerusalem with, with five Roman legions, five. They surrounded it. They put up siege works. They uh, starved the people of Israel. And over two and a half years, they breached the, excuse me, the walls of Jerusalem. They uh, attacked, they say, between 1.1 and 1.2 million Jews were slaughtered when they breached the walls. All those besides those that were slaughtered were shipped off to Alexandria, Egypt, as slaves 
to work in the mines there. Uh, that would have been a short life. They destroyed the temple. They burned it. And they led everybody off into slavery. Times then for those early Christians experiencing the fall of Jerusalem and the scattering of Israel, the attempt by Rome to literally eradicate the nation of Israel, wipe it from the face of the earth, uh, was a tough time. But yet the church endured. The church came through that. They were, yes, they were scattered. That's the fact. They were scattered all over the world because of the Roman persecution, but they endured and they passed on. Verse 14, by the Holy Spirit's help, they passed on to us. They guarded the good deposit entrusted to you. And you and I wouldn't be here today had they not been faithful to pass on the good truth, the good deposit, the pattern of sound words that Paul's talking about. They were not overcome even by this horrendous Roman persecution. All right, verse 16, it says, May the Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. Well, here's, here's a contrast for you. Look, look back over there at 15. You've got two people that walked away, right? They abandoned him. They turned away from Paul. And yet, verse 16, he tells us about a man uh, who was from a different cloth. This, this man evidently traveled to Rome to find Paul. Uh, and if I could illustrate just a little bit for you, you know, uh, prison ministry today is a wonderful thing. If we want to go see a prisoner, we can look him up in the state uh, registry, find out what prison he's in, and we can go visit them. Well, in the first century, it wasn't like that. They didn't have these massive prisons like we have today. Oft times they were converted houses uh, with just a few prisoner, prisoners in each one. And there was not a registry. Uh, this man here in verse 16 must have gone house to house to house looking in Rome until he found Paul. And then when he found him, he says in verse 16, he often refreshed me. He, he uh, probably brought Paul, some some uh, some food, uh, maybe some clothing. Uh, it was cold. Um, maybe he he just came and he visited with Paul and cheered him up and consoled him in the time of his imprisonment. I don't know what he did, but it's clear that Paul was blessed by him. He was often refreshing me. He says, and lastly, importantly, he was not ashamed of his chains. Uh, and I know you've all heard the description of Roman uh, uh, arrest. Uh, typically, in Rome, a man would be uh, under house arrest, and they would put a chain, a shackle on each each wrist, and then they would the other end of the chain had a Roman soldier uh, attached to that chain, and they would they would sit there for eight or ten hours with that prisoner. Uh, he's chained to two Romans, Roman soldiers, and then there would be a shift change, maybe two times a day, maybe three times a day. They would change out soldiers. But Paul was sitting there reading, I mean, rather writing this book of Second Timothy with two Romans chained uh, to his wrists. Uh, I wonder how long it took for them to accept Christ. Uh, with, can you imagine being chained to the Apostle Paul? Uh, but it wasn't long. Uh, but in, anyway, there was a shame. Uh, there's a natural thing of shame to look at a prisoner and think, uh, you know, uh, there's somebody that is not in God's good graces. Uh, but how wrong that is. That Paul was uh, the apostle Paul. Uh, he, he had a friend here, Onesimus, that was not ashamed to see that he had chains on and that he was a prisoner. So he often refreshed him. He was not afraid of his chains. And zealously, I, incredibly, he must have searched all over Rome to even find Paul uh, to be able to have a ministry to him. 
Verse 17 it says, When he arrived in Rome, he searched for me earnestly, and he found me. Uh, he didn't give up. He kept going to these all these little prison houses until he found the Apostle Paul. So Paul says in verse 18, May the Lord grant him to find mercy from the Lord on that day. And you well know all the service he rendered at Ephesus. So there's another little clue. First century church. Evidently, this man was from the Ephesus church in Greece, and he traveled all the way to Rome to minister to Paul. Uh, that's, that's, that's a friend. Uh, I want to point out, uh, even though we're talking about a book written in 67 AD, that in verse 18, Paul reveals the early church had a hope that Jesus was coming back. Mercy from the Lord on that day. That, that day is the day that he comes back. That, that's the day that we're still hoping for. Uh, we pray and we ask, Lord, come soon. Uh, we're in the same situation that the first century church was and that we're anticipating the Lord Jesus Christ coming back to earth just like he did the first time and reclaim his church that day. Well, we've got just a little bit of ways to go this morning, so I'm gonna I'm gonna cross right over till uh, to chapter two. So if you'll turn there in your Bibles, we'll uh, we'll pick it up there where we just left off in chapter chapter one. Uh, and as I've studied for this chapter and, and uh, gotten familiar with it, uh, I've titled it will work till Jesus comes. Now, that's not original, is it? I know there's a song named that, a hymn, and I like that one. Uh, but I think you'll see as we go through this, that's what the Paul's teaching uh, Timothy here, that we're going to work till Jesus comes back. So he says to Timothy, you then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that's in Christ Jesus. Uh, very um, I don't want to say common, but Paul uses a greeting like this pretty often in his epistles. Uh, be, be strengthened by the grace that's in Christ Jesus. Uh, and that's not to uh, take away from the strength of the words because we all need to be strengthened by grace in the Lord Jesus. But uh, I do want to say that this is one of 25 times that Paul encouraged Timothy to be strong and endure in the work he was doing over there in Ephesus. 25 times he encouraged Timothy in First and Second Timothy, be strong. Uh, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm just awful uh, proud to know what I know about Timothy uh, and the work that he did and then the way he ended his life as a martyr. Uh, but this just wants to show you that he was a, he was a man just like we are that needed encouragement. Uh, he wasn't he wasn't some uh, Superman that uh, uh, just had all the qualities of the Christian life built into him, and he just marched through the town of Ephesus. No, I think he was timid. I, I think Timothy was uh, a little bit timid by nature. Uh, now, Apostle Paul, I can't say that. I don't think he was at all, but. Timothy apparently was, because Paul's continually encouraging him to be strong. Uh, so, be strong, that would come right on the heels of what we just read, remember, in the first chapter at the end of it, those two men that departed from Paul and walked away. Uh, they had concluded that this, uh, this Christian fight, this war, uh, it was too much, and they walked away. Uh, and many fall away. But Paul is telling Timothy, it doesn't matter that many fall away. You be strong. You finish the race. And I think he's telling him to be strong also for another reason. Uh, Paul will very shortly be dead. He will be executed by Rome, and he's not going to be there to uh, bolster the faith of Timothy. He's not going to have his spiritual father much longer, and he's going to have to uh, continue the fight on his own. And 
uh, when Paul says be strengthened, it's it's something that you and I can can uh, grab hold of, because uh, the truth is, uh, strength comes from God. Be strengthened by the grace that's in the in Christ Jesus. Um, Isaiah forty says uh, he gives power to the weak, and to those who have no might he increases strength. Those that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. Um, Isaiah 40. Um, strength comes from the Lord, and it's something that we have to receive. Um, we can pray and ask for it, because he has it and we don't. And to have it, when he answers that prayer, we have to receive it. We have to willingly uh, ask for it, and then uh, receive it to us. Now, he uses that word grace there. That's that's a interesting uh, word. We all know we're saved by grace. We all know that. But, you know, even though we know that, uh, this word grace has been abused in the church. Uh, some people believe grace is a permission to sin. You know, I'm saved by grace. All my sins have been forgiven, past, present, and future. Therefore, it doesn't matter what I do. He loves me, and he's going to forgive everything. Uh, cheap grace, I think, is what Dietrich Bonhoeffer called it. Uh, permission to sin. That's not right. Uh, some people believe that grace is, is God. I guess you could say that he's letting up on his standards to us that this grace just flows from heaven all over us and we drown in it and it doesn't matter what we do and we don't have to do anything because grace is overwhelming and it's going to uh, it's gonna carry us through and get us to heaven one day. And yet, you know, friends, when you study the New Testament as a serious student, uh, that's a bold-faced lie because... Uh, even though we understand that God's grace is what has saved us, we are continually encouraged in the scripture along with grace to have works, to have good works. Because of this grace that has forgiven us when we don't deserve to be forgiven, but he did it anyway, uh, that we're to uh, receive that grace and accept it for what it is and then work until Jesus comes. It's always that way in the scripture. Uh, some people think that grace opposes uh, our effort. What do I mean by that? Well, they, some people teach that grace is this uh, over overwhelming uh, cloud that descends on a Christian and just sort of catches him up, uh, carries him through life without any effort on his part, without any work on his part. It opposes any effort in our life. That's not true either. As I just said, Scripture teaches both, side by side. Um, and then there's another one, uh, the grace is something. Grace is only for godly people, whatever that is, uh, whatever they think it is, brother. You know what it is, I know, but grace is not for godly people. It's for ungodly people. Uh, God commended his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, right, Christ died for us. That's grace. Grace is for the unworthy, and we all are unworthy. Uh, it's not just for some people that get so spiritual that God blesses them with grace. Grace is not that way. Grace is God coming to find us in a state of sin and lostness, and he saves us because he, he loves us. Uh, so those are just some misconceptions you might hear from time to time. Paul, when we talk about grace, he's been he's telling Timothy, be strengthened by the grace that's in Christ Jesus. Paul knew what that was. Uh, he's not he's not making that up. Second uh, Corinthians twelve, he said, uh, my Jesus said to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest on me. Uh, 
that was Paul's testimony. Uh, he, had, he had been strengthened by grace. He had, he had prayed repeatedly for this thorn to be removed from him. Uh, Christ gave him the answer of no. It's going to stay because my grace is sufficient for you. All right. Let's do one more verse. Uh, at verse 2. What you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Uh, you're using your little pencil or highlighter there in verse 2. You might notice there's four generations of Christians there. There's the Apostle Paul. You've heard it from me. You is Timothy in the presence of many witnesses, then entrust this, share this, teach this to faithful men. There's three who will be able to teach others also. There's four. Uh, the picture here is of disciples of Jesus Christ intentionally looking for faithful men and women to share what they have learned, their testimony, and then leading them to reproduce themselves. In other words, uh, you lead them to Christ and teach them how to be a disciple, and then they go out and lead someone to Christ, and uh, they become a disciple. That's how, the, that's how the church works. That's how Christianity thrives. It's not a, it's not a description, verse 2, of a, of a great pastor in a pulpit uh, propagating the Christian church. It doesn't work like that. It works by people sharing with their children and their grandchildren, their friends, uh, the co-workers, uh, fellow soldiers, uh, sharing the faith, sharing the gospel with people. They become saved, they become born again, and then they can go out and do the same thing. And that's, that's a model of church growth right there for you in verse 2. So I think it would be fair to say, you correct me if I'm wrong, that it's not only a privilege that we uh, have the gospel shared with us and we are saved, it's also a duty of ours to transmit it. Don't let it stop with you. Uh, I don't know all of your testimonies. I know some, and uh, I know how it was, whether it was a Sunday school teacher or your parents or a friend that led you to Christ well, there you are in verse 2. Have you transmitted it on to someone else who can disciple someone else as well? I do want to point out, and I think it's important, uh, we don't want to miss a key word there in verse 2, and that is entrust it to faithful men. Faithful men. Uh, and that obviously that will in include women, uh, in that sense, Timothy's been told by Paul to find people that were faithful, uh, people that were able to place their trust in Christ and then be faithful to that truth the rest of their life. In this case, being faithful would be one who transmitted the faith on to someone else that was faithful. So, you know, it's interesting here that he used that word faithful. Uh, he didn't ask him to go find some smart men or some popular men or some strong men or some perfect men or some good-looking men. He told him to look for faithful men, faithful men and women, that when they are entrusted with the truth of the gospel, will treasure that in their hearts and be compelled, understand, see that this is the truth and I need to share it with those that are in my circles. The word faithful is in Greek is, is pistos, is the word, P-I-S-T-O-S. -S. Um, it means a person who is a believer. They are a believing person. Then it means a person who is loyal, a person who is reliable. It's, it's all of those things. That's what a faithful person is. Now, 
it is time. I look up and I see that clock counting there. I've got to, got to stop. We'll pick up next week at verse 3. Heavenly Father, I pray this morning to thank you uh, for my class. I uh, thank you for all my brothers and sisters that are listening. I pray for each one of them, Lord, uh, that these teachings of Paul to Timothy would be uh, brought personally into their own lives and their hearts and their minds and their spirits. I pray, Father, that you'll transform us, that you'll aid us in the task of uh, transmitting this gospel story to those that are around us, that the faith might go on. Lord, we look for the day that you return and, and be with us. We pray that it's soon, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.